Hello, thank you all for joining us tonight. My name is Michael Famigetti. I'm the editor of Aperture Magazine. For those of you who are not familiar with Aperture, we were founded in 1952 by a group of artists, writers, and curators as common ground for photography. Aperture today is a multi-platform publisher that unites the photography community in print, in person, and online. Tonight, uh, we're very excited to be here with Tyler Mitchell and Salamisha Tillett to kick off our series of programming coinciding with the winter issue of Aperture Magazine titled Utopia. You may be wondering why this topic after a year that has felt more dystopian than utopian. Um, but I think one of the texts in the issue by a writer named Chris Jennings in his contribution gives an important response. He writes, the utopian imagination tends to stir when the world feels simultaneously wrecked and malleable. Dreams of the perfect society have never been about distant lands or gleaming futures. Utopia is diagnostic. It is a way to see the present anew and to give some shape to our hopes and grievances. In this issue of the magazine, photographers and writers envision a world without prisons, document visionary architecture, honor queer space and creativity, and dream of liberty through spiritual self-expression. They show us that utopia is not a far-fetched scheme, but rather a way of reshaping our future. The cover feature of the issue is dedicated to Tyler Mitchell's visionary work. And inside is a beautiful profile by Salamisha Tillett. As Tillett writes, Mitchell offers us a black utopia in which the couture and the common sit next to each other. And in which black people in London, in Brooklyn, in Atlanta, in Los Angeles, and throughout the African diaspora find one another as relief and community. And therein lies Mitchell's gift and genius to reimagine our world with the possibilities and agency of Black life. Thank you, Salamisha and Tyler, for being, with here, being here with us tonight and for your pictures and words. Salamisha Tillett is the Henry Rutgers Professor of Creative Writing and African-American and African Studies at Rutgers University and the Faculty Director of New Arts Justice, an initiative for feminist approaches to socially engaged art at Express Newark. She is a contributing critic at large for the New York Times and the author of multiple works, as well as the recipient of the Whiting Foundation Creative Nonfiction Grant. With her sister, photogra photographer Sherazad Tillett, she founded A Long Walk Home, an art organization that empowers young people to end violence against girls and women. Tyler Mitchell is a photographer and filmmaker based in Brooklyn working across many genres to explore and document a new aesthetic of blackness. In 2018, he made history as the first black photographer to shoot a cover of American Vogue for Beyonce's appearance in the September issue. His work has been acquired by the Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery and his first solo exhibition, I Can Make You Feel Good was presented at Foam in Amsterdam and is now on view at the International Center of Photography here in New York. In 2020, Mitchell was announced as the recipient of the Gordon Parks Fellowship, which will culminate in an exhibition of new works at the Gordon Parks Foundation Gallery. I would also like to add that Tyler was in our 2018 Summer Open at Aperture, and his work is on the cover of uh, last year's publication, The New Black Vanguard, which was written by critic Antoine Sargent and published by Aperture. Um, I just want to thank um, those who supported this program. Um, it's supported um, and presented in partnership with the London-based fashion brand, J.W. Anderson. And significant support for Aperture Magazine is provided by the Kanakia Foundation and by John Stryker and Slobodan Radilovich. Further generous support is, is provided in part by the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs and the New York State Council on the Arts. Tonight, we are offering viewers a discount off the Utopia issue um, and for magazine subscriptions, you can find the discount code in the chat. Aperture is a not-for-profit publication, so the easiest way to support us is to become a subscriber. Um, I would also like to mention that uh, there will be a Q&A, so you can put your questions in the chat and uh, we will get to them at the end of the talk. Um, and now I'm very happy to turn this over to Tyler Mitchell. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And yeah, um, thank you, Aperture, for having us tonight to convene digitally. Um, 
and you know it's a really special uh night moment for me michael because uh collaborating with aperture as you said has been uh a long-standing relationship since the summer since the summer opened show in 2018 and so to be featured in this way on the utopia issue is a huge huge honor um i basically just wanted to kick off the talk i see they left they turned their cameras off <laughs> but i basically um wanted to kick off the talk with just reading uh, a statement that I've written from my book and give a little introduction about my work. Um, I'll share my screen and then show some images. Um, so, I Can Make You Feel Good, right? The title of my show at the International Center of Photography as Michael mentioned and my book, um, I often think about what white fun looks like and this notion that black people can't have the same. Growing up with Tumblr, I would often come across images of sensual, young, attractive white models running around being free and having fun. The kind of stuff Larry Clark and Ryan McGinley would make. I seldom saw the same for black people in images, or at least in the photography I knew then. My work comes from a place of wanting to push back against this lack. I feel an urgency to create a body of images where Black people are visualized as free, expressive, effortless, and sensitive. I aim to visualize what a Black utopia looks like or could look like. Uh, people say utopia is never achievable, but I love photography's possibility of allowing me to dream and to make that dream become very real. In my work, I use the tools of documentary reportage, portraiture, fashion photography, art photography, and filmmaking. I view fashion as a space and opportunity to have clothes uh, enhance uh, my message about the black body. I make very little distinction between my commissioned and my personal works. And I use them both as an opportunity to create this utopian universe. Um, whether that's photographing Beyonce, Spike Lee, skaters in Cuba, or my very close friends. Documented and real or fictitious and staged, my images are characterized by an interest in purity and intimacy. In them, models recline, embrace each other closely, and peer into the lens, leaving evidence of a public display of affirmation and blackness and a unifying visual text of hope. I also occasionally weave symbols into my portraits, such as water guns and plastic resin chains, uh, symbols of repression, as a subtle reminder of the ways in which the black body is still politicized and sometimes unable to move through the world as freely as I would like. Uh, I can make you feel good is simply a declaration and one that I feel is gut punching in its optimism. It feels important at a time like this to declare such a thing. Um, that uh, was written actually in transit to Amsterdam to have a, a meeting and to see about the prospect of doing uh, mounting an exhibition with foam in Amsterdam. And when thinking about uh, what, if I were to self-author what I think or hope uh, my collection of work is doing, um, it would be that. Um, so I just wanted to kick that off before we got into a conversation with Salamisha. And um, yeah, I think uh, that's that. Um. This is great. And I'm so honored to be with you again um, during this period, which is a very difficult period for all of us. And so I guess I wanna start with this idea of utopia and black utopia, because it is now, you know, as you just read, um, such a definitive aspect of your work. But I actually didn't ask you in our summer interview when you decided, when this concept came to you, like how old were you? Did it just arrive? Had you been, you know, thinking about utopia in different ways. So just in a general, I guess, framing, when did you come up with this idea of black utopia as a way to think about your work? Mm. Um, um, I mean, I, I think that there was always an interest. I mean, first I want to jump off from going from what you wrote, which was beautiful in the Aperture issue, right? Uh, you know, and kind of thinking about our great interview and conversation we had in the summer and thinking about what I really loved about that was how we kind of rambled and went all over the place through our conversation. And yeah. that, that for me, I love interviews and kind of conversations like that. And so I hope we do that tonight as well. Yeah, you're one of my favorite, you're like my top three. 
favorite <laughs> interviews. And just for no one else knows this, but you and me, but it was a crazy chaotic interview because there are three things that happened. My children uh, kept on uh, emerging because I do most of my interviews, not tonight, but usually in the bedroom of my eight-year-old daughter. So she, it's her space that I'm interviewing people, famous people uh, often. <laughs> Uh, then there was the bee. You were wearing a very nice, you were in London and outside. So I was very jealous because you were like outside in, in urban nature. You had that striped shirt on and the bee kept on. Remember the bee was like. Uh, yeah. There was this bee that kept like thinking I was a flower basically. <laughs> <Landing there. laughs> so then you had to like go inside and then yeah. your computer died. You could, like that was the end of the interview. Your computer died. And I was like. <laughs> that was so, yeah. <laughs> So I guess maybe we could just start. One of the things that I connected, we, we'll get to Black Utopia, but I guess one of the things that was so wonderful about our experience together um, is that this idea, it was so like non-hierarchical because we were like one in the pandemic in a child's bedroom, you have a bee following you, your computer died. Like it was such a human uh, kind of organic experience, even though it was our first time meeting. And you have a lot of, people who adore you. Um, and so that was, it. you know, I spoke to them before even talking to you. So that was, that helped frame our conversation as well. But yeah, I think your work, um, this kind of, it, it, there's a casual couture, I guess, mm -hmm. or common coutureness to your work. And I think we were able to establish that in that conversation. So thank yeah. you for, for, for being one of my most delightful interviewees ever. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, I guess that goes into the question because I think that um, when you think about this idea of utopia, right, or leaning into sites of joy, right, or kind of um, making images that lean into joy, that lean into the pleasurable, that lean into leisure time, right, outdoor space, um, seemingly kind of mundane enjoyment of whether it's childlike exercise, hula hooping, mm -hmm. right, whether that's skateboarding, whether that's jump roping, it's kind of like all of that, um, I think first instinctively came from just wanting to make images in which I kind of could create a world in which I wanted to see myself exist in, right? So mm -hmm. some of it's instinctive and in, in that like, you look at images, uh, right? And then you have an instinct to make images. And so I kind of wrote a bit about that in which I was inspired, right? By things I saw on the internet where I'm kind of seeing youth enjoying themselves out in public space and I kind of look at it and I say that you know I want to create that but I also want to be that I want to do that I think that making images can encourage folks who look like me to enjoy public space in similar ways mm -hmm. so um I think that's where the instinct came from before I even knew what to call it or whether to call it utopia right mm -hmm. which comes with all these um contexts and these meanings it was really about creating a world that leaned into Black folks enjoying themselves in public mm -hmm. space and what mm -hmm. that could mean in the conversation of photography and art and what that means against the backdrop of so much of what we know in this year and years past of us not being able to enjoy public space so um, in the ways that we you know would like to. So um, yeah. I think that's where the instinct came from and then calling it utopia kind of came when I started to you know, frame up ideas around the show at foam and just continue, you know, to grow. You yeah. Know, time. Yeah. So, I mean, let's just talk about this a little bit more about play because I'm inspired by you. And then my sister, Shahara Zadu, is a photographer. She, she's doing a whole series on Black girlhood. And she talks about play as the closest we get to freedom, right? So that there's a way in which children's playing or Black people being, as you talk about, in, in leisure or repose as a way of approximating a freedom that's denied to us in the United States or in England or in many places throughout the world. So I find it interesting that because you came to photography and film as a skater, these were ideas that were like always tied to each other. They were not separate. And so you just kind of went in there and then opened up our vocabulary um, but can you just talk a little bit about your biography? Because it's not a very common, I mean, it's, it's common for certain, not common, but it's, there are certain people who, like white men who often have that as an entry point into film, but not a lot of black artists have that. So do you want to talk a little bit more about the way in which you <laughs> developed your visual vocabulary yeah. through play? Yeah, no, okay, that's, that's a good way to frame it up because I think, um, well, 
you know, being born and raised uh, in basically suburban Atlanta, Georgia, mm -hmm. uh, Cobb County, Marietta, East Cobb. Um, I think before I kind of found skateboarding, it was really kind of going to school and kind of curricular sport activities. And those activities that were encouraged were, you know, whether it's football, track and field, basketball, soccer, um, all of which are great, you know, mm -hmm. but all have a different kind of attitude than skateboarding in a way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and and no, no, no one better or worse than the other. But I say that to say, I think when I found skateboarding, something unlocked, like you said, and it's not uncommon and it's not never been done before, but skateboarding really is a great portal into kind of making images for a lot of different reasons. I think that, yeah, once I kind of found skateboarding and really had this urge for whatever reason at the age of 13 to, to teach myself on YouTube, basically in my garage, how to skateboard, um, I then branched out into greater Atlanta, right? I got outside of my social circles and met lots of different people from lots of different backgrounds, lots of different pockets of the city. Um, and there became this like community that was formed, right? So I started to understand ideas of like forming your own family and like um, having a community um, mm -hmm. from a sport rather than kind of a team mentality where it's like, we're going to beat them. It's kind of, you're in this community and you're trying to kind of better yourself at the sport rather than kind of beat somebody else, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. um, so there was that notion always. And also, um, yeah, like I said, it, it's, skateboarding is such a natural portal into making images because you start to consider things like architecture, right? So actual mm -hmm. space mm -hmm. uh, as kind of usable and functional in other creative ways that people don't normally use a stair set, a railway, things like that, a curb. But also mm -hmm. um, because you, there's an art form behind the making of the images of the sport itself. And I think, um, yeah, I don't know. I think from, the, I don't know if that answers your question, but I guess like all of that got me thinking about, like you said, from maybe from the inside out, maybe I'm not even aware of it, but uh, those moments uh, in Atlanta and Georgia where I felt the most free were kind of being outside skateboarding, you know, being with friends. So I think um, mm -hmm. replicating that in my work and trying to get at that feeling in my portraiture and my images is something that's kind of inherent. You know, it's not mm -hmm. something I'm thinking about overtly, yeah. So can I ask you, I'm just gonna stay with the skateboarding a little bit, but it seems to me that that's all, that, that speed is such a big part of that practice. And mm. your work is, and Deb talks about this, Deb Willis talks about this in, in her essay on, on you about, the, she talks about silence, but another way to think about it is also stillness. So how did you, you know what I mean? Like how, how, how are these two things operating with the young Tyler Mitchell? Like a, as you're trying to capture the complexity, the dynamism, the community that's being shaped. And then your work that as we receive it today is, I mean, it's portraiture, but it's also really about stillness and about a particular staging of black bodies, um, sometimes in motion, but a lot of times, you know, the, the genre forces it to be frozen, but there's something about your aesthetic that's trying to get us to sit in the silence of the photograph and right. experience the community and the bodies that are there before us right like slow down a bit yeah um i mean it's a good question because there's also like all these theories around understanding time in different ways from skateboarding so i don't know mm. If, mm. i don't know if there's a connection there but when you're editing skateboarding videos which i was doing a lot mm. you're understanding time and also different ways to like you're ramping the footage to slow it down and like catch mm. the moment where the board gets caught and then you're speeding it back up. And so mm. I don't know if that has a connection, but I definitely think um, something about the slow stillness of the South, right? Meeting mm. with skateboarding and the dynamism mm. Um, mm. might be it. And also just like thinking about summers in Atlanta and the heat and how that sometimes the heat would slow you down to just needing to just lay down in the grass and just stare at the sky for a little bit, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I even remember like my friends and I, we had a DIY skate park, which was basically a plot of land that was near a friend's house that we kind of turned into our house in a way. Mm -hmm. Nobody had claimed this land. And so that became our little repose. It was surrounded by trees mm. and it was in the middle of Atlanta, but it was completely surrounded by greenery. And so that was a space that I think about a lot. So um, I don't know if it's intentional or if it's kind of unintentional, but um, yeah, it's a really good question. So let's talk about Atlanta, because that was one of, you know, as a writer, you're, 
you read all the profiles on, on the person and you try to read as many essays as possible. And then you, for me anyway, I try to figure out what can I do that's different um, uh, on, and, and then, you know, the fact that people rarely write about you um, through the lens of the, the Black South and, and through Georgia was exciting for me, probably because I've been working on this project on Alice Walker for the last two years, but also just because uh, I, it made sense to me all of a sudden, if you think about you as a Southern photographer, as a Black Southern photographer, then we can understand why you're so embracing of and embedding your work in the natural landscape. Mm -hmm. um, but so the fact that you, and everyone probably knows this about me, but you talked about Atlanta as the greenest city in the United States in terms of just pure acreage of green, of, of parks and, and forestation. So can you just talk a little bit about how in many ways, maybe despite the fact that you're traveling the world with your images, that there's always an attempt to return to home? Or I don't know if you think about it as actively as I, I, I discovered, but it was kind of beautiful to think of you in this, this longer tradition of uh, Black uh, Atlanta, Black Georgia, and then also the Black South. Right. Yeah, no, and that was one of my favorite parts of kind of being interviewed by you and being in conversation by you as well was because you wanted to focus on that, which <laughs> I'm always so excited to talk about any opportunity, basically. That's okay. about home is A good. match made and, in heaven, yeah. <laughs> and and the projects you're doing about the South. And But um, I'll share my screen um, so we can maybe look at some images while... Yes. Uh, let's see here. Because it's unfair to just talk about your work without looking at oh this is gorgeous right and so you know thinking about the natural landscape um and bringing home to other places you know this portrait was made in in Walthamstow outside of London in England right but um I've always I think again it's an inherent aesthetic response sometimes to my favorite photographers or just my favorite images that I come across mm. so you know the first exposures which I write about in that text are you know, your Larry Clarks, your Ryan McGinley's, your kind of nihilistic or free youth enjoying public space. And then it grows into deeper research. It grows into understanding Gordon Parks. It grows into understanding Carrie Mae Weems. It grows into understanding Carrie James Marshall and uh, his vignette paintings. It grows into uh, early Hudnall Jr., who we, who we wrote about in the piece. And so um, all of these people are kind of, to some degree, or at some point in their body of work exploring Black folks in kind of natural landscapes. Mm -hmm. and, um, I always found myself just drawn to those works. Mm -hmm. uh, but this portrait was made in, in Walthamstow in London, England. And yeah, I mean, the willow trees remind me of Georgia. They could mm -hmm. remind me of parts of the South. Um, and, but also, you know, there's this part where the boys themselves sculpturally right? There's kind of an element of like formal rigor here as well in that mm. they sculpturally become one with the landscape and they also mm. become reminiscent of uh, a heavier history, right? There's mm -hmm. a unison and a joy mm -hmm. to a certain degree, but there's also this heaviness um, that's embedded within the history of when you think about chain gangs and mm -hmm. um, Black folks shirtless in fields, right? Um, skateboarding again this was actually shot at the skate park that I grew up going to um, and it was a still from a project called idyllic space in which I'm considering and kind of simply filming and then projecting on the ceiling within the ICP show uh, young black men in Atlanta enjoying enjoying uh, public space hmm. tour as you call it <laughs> <laughs> I'm skipping around now, so cut me off whenever, but. No, I mean, it's just gorgeous. Um, you can, do you want to continue talking or do you want me to? No, no, is... no, I was done. Now I just started to get, you know, I just started to, to go through the pictures. <laughs> well, I, oh, no, 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 I mean, let's look at this. So I, I guess I have a question about, um, I mean, just the work that you just showed us, right? So some of the, these are, and part of what was fascinating about your book is that there, you wanted us to kind of, move through image through image without um, being interrupted by uh, text, right? And so right. we don't know where we are oftentimes, right? And, and so when you're showing us London, it looks like Georgia or it looks like it could look like um, uh, parts of Atlanta. Um, but also this idea in which, you know, we also don't know if those, like I can't tell if that's a fashion shoot or right. if that's 
you photographing your friends. And so this move between the familiar and then what is the exalted in, in our culture, you really kind of blur those lines in really beautiful and democratic ways. But I also think it's like fascinating that um, one of the things that we talked about is this is a, a way in which Tumblr shaped your aesthetic, you know? Like, so like, no, you know, for generations my age or older, like it'd be kind of impossible to understand how Tumblr could be such a formative part of someone's <laughs> photographic uh, foundation. But can you just talk a little bit about one, how that shaped you, but then two, um, what's at stake in you giving us images and creating images where the hierarchy is kind of blurred? Like we're not supposed to know, you know, you could have an image of Beyonce or you can have a, an image of um, another person that's completely less familiar to us and they, you treat them similarly. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, that's been, I mean, you kind of, you, you kind of said it right there. Like, um, yeah, part of it is probably, or part of it is definitely um, coming from Tumblr and my understanding of images and kind of how I educated myself on what creative photography or art photography or um, photography as a canon is, was really from engaging with it in a decontextualized way, right? Like, mm. I come to images at just as I'm scrolling through them now, right? Like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, as you're scrolling through and Tumblr was my first, you know, but this is happening on Instagram, it's happening on plenty of places now. But for me, when it was Tumblr, um, you're not receiving images with credit, right? So you're kind of seeing an image, you're understanding it as something that you're inherently or aesthetically drawn to, and you're kind of seeing it next to something completely different. Mm. And I think you wrote in the piece something about kind of classical Rococo painting sitting next to modern interior sitting next to portraiture sitting next to uh the work of what have you carrie james marshall next to the work of uh, cindy sherman so you're getting this wide art hmm. and photography education through just seeing what people are blogging and reblogging and what's getting around more than other stuff hmm. and so um i guess understanding images in that way but hmm. also kind of wanting hopefully my contribution to the canon of photography and like all the all these things is hopefully um hopefully we're starting to break down or break break away at the barriers of like certain uh commissions as being higher or better than others certain um not sure image types body types right uh, people mm -hmm. it's all of that it's all of kind of trying to break down the hierarchies within a lot of things in photography and um so that's why it's kind of like, as you said it, how did you say it? You kind of said exalting the everyday citizen mm. and kind of, um, what was, uh, and, and what was the I other don't know, thing? because you know when I write it, you know, I don't, <laughs> and then it, it sounds so good when you say it back to me, but it's kind of, I don't know if this is how you experience your work, but sometimes the things just come yeah. and then you're surprised that you could do that. So it yeah. sounds like amazing, whatever. Like, yeah, yeah. I no, probably said exalting because I like the E and the E, the alliteration. So it sounds like something I would have done. So. <laughs> yeah, no, but you said that. You said kind of how how I exalt the, you know, the everyday citizen or the everyday person. And it's definitely, mm. that. it's, you know, it's kind of putting this all on an even playing field and even thinking about um, the terms around photography, right? Capture, mm. shoot, subject, object, these kinds of things. Um, subverting those as much as possible whenever possible. Um, mm. So that includes like, that includes just collaborating more with models within a fashion context, which mm. doesn't happen as often as, as you would think. You know, when you start to understand the mechanism of a fashion commission or like a fashion photography shoot, mm. there's so much being dictated to the model, right? They're not, they're not kind of allowed a lot of autonomy within that. And there's been a lot, there's an increasing amount written about this. And I think mm -hmm. it's coming into our culture more now, which mm -hmm. I'm happy about because um, there should be, or what I hopefully try to create space for is a conversation um, between myself and whoever it is that I'm photographing because you're depicting them, and you're rendering them and you'd like that to be hopefully not only in their most favorable light, but in one that makes you both happy with the portrait you're coming away with, so yeah. So guys, I haven't seen this image, but this is like you, this is like, you know, where what's invoked on one hand is like labor, right? Like laundry. Um, and laundresses and launderers, I guess. And then at the same time, the way that the, the two people are um, leaning on each other and heads, you know, it's all about like a relief from the labor. I mean, it's really gorgeous. 
um, how all of that can be happening. And then the blue, I don't know, this is this is nice to see. So I'm just, I'm doing, doing some freestyle uh, art criticism here. But again, this idea of you having, at this stage of your life, you have, a, there's something very clear and definitive about your style as you're growing, but there's a way in which we can know what a Tyler Mitchell photograph looks like because of the ways in which many things are happening at once. And yet we've never really seen it before uh, that moment. And so I guess I have a, two questions. One is about, you, you arrived in many people's homes, uh, by your images anyway, of, of Beyonce. And you, you're the first African-American photographer on the cover of Vogue, uh, the youngest photographer, I, I assume, you're the youngest, were you not the youngest? I think, someone, uh, yeah. Someone else younger, like someone was 20, you were 21, right, or 23? I was 23. There are a few photographers that have been younger. Really? Okay, <laughs> Okay. well, let's just go with the first African-American, which I'm, we're certain uh, of. Now, what did that, what was that like for you? Because I don't know if it puts an enormous amount of pressure on an artist who's becoming who they're going to be. Or was it, I mean, of course you were grateful, of course it was exciting, but I'm just curious yeah. about that process for you once it arrived in our homes and in our newsstands, and did it make you feel like, oh God, I gotta like, the next image has gotta be, or did it, right. did it give you a freedom that perhaps, right. you know, you didn't know you were going to have? I mean, this is a huge ongoing, growing question and answer response happening in the moment right now in my life. Yeah. You know? I'm still creating work. I'm still a young artist who is thankful ultimately to be able to have the space um, to grow my practice yeah. and to be encouraged by um, amazing uh, Black critics, Black thinkers, Black writers, um, and other critics, thinkers, writers who push and engage the work. You know, we're here right now with Aperture. This is a form of critical engagement for me, this conversation. Like, mm -hmm. it, um, you know, so asking for more of that, right? Se searching for more of that is what I try and do. And I think, um, all, all you can kind of ask for as an artist is to be in conversation with great folks because that's where the inspiration is going to come. And so I think mm. like, for me, um, it's been amazing to be engaged in this way to be featured in Aperture, right? To continue to be featured and, and, and kind of um, uh, like fortunate enough to be celebrated, but also engaged um, at mm. every step of the way. And the mm -hmm. fact that the internet can be such a great site of call and response with people, mm -hmm. right? That like, mm -hmm. I can post stuff and I can have a dialogue with where the work is going right there in the moment. And that, mm -hmm. you know, that's been a great part of making images for me. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's been about taking the space necessary when necessary to just grow my practice and mm -hmm. about where that's going to go and what uh, makes me the image maker I am. So yeah. I want to talk a bit about training um, and Deb Willis as a mutual, as a mentor of yours and, and as a mentor to many of us um, and your awareness of history. Um, Cause this was one of the pleasurable things about talking to you is that you're just so aware of the artists that come before you, the way in which they shape how we understand black bodies uh, and the images um, of, of black bodies, but also yourself. And I was just curious, like, you know, let's just talk about Deb's influence on you. Um, and, and what is it that uh, you were able to experience um, through that mentorship, but also in those classrooms that also shape your practice alongside Tumblr and, and skating and, and other um, influences? Yeah. Well, I, like I always call it the, the the school of Deb in a way, you know, <laughs> you kind of come through the school of Deb and then you come out a different person, I guess, so to speak. But I mean, I, um, yeah, I was a, you know, I was predominantly a filmmaker and film mm -hmm. student when I moved up to New York, when mm -hmm. I got to NYU, um, which, you know, Deb is the, you know, chair of the department of photography. So as I started to experiment, I always sim was simultaneously experimenting with photography and filmmaking at the same time. Mm. Um, but as I started to get more serious about photography, I kept sneaking on to the photo floor in the building, in the NYU building. And eventually she saw me and said, you know, if you want to use the labs, you should just take my course. You should take a course in the department. Mm. And um, so that's when I took, I believe it was Black Body in the Lens, and then subsequently several other courses in which she teaches, you know, basically the history of all these things. But she also kind of talks about... Um, as she writes about and as she, you know, 
create about the amazing archive, right, of Black images, um, this idea of this, under, this deep understanding, she says, of um, Black folks and their dress, how they present themselves through clothes, right? So that got me thinking about fashion as a space to have mm. conversations. Um, and like, even, you know, how, how she talks about like Frederick Douglass, for example, who understood the importance of making, uh, right, like a dignified portrait of himself. Mm -hmm. And she's all about that. You know, she's all about kind of this idea of understanding of dignity, beauty, and uh, identity and photography. So I guess I just kind of, that's a huge, huge, yeah. huge mark on me, you know? Yeah, I didn't know. I mean, I hadn't talked to you about that. So I could see how um, the influence and then this relationship between the cinematic and the photographic where you were the film and, and film and photography. So I didn't realize you went to, I mean, you are both, but then I didn't realize that you went one way and then embrace this other part of your identity because they were mutually constituted. Um, you know, you, you said to me that you were photographing and then you'd switch the mode and then you would start. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess I was just curious, what do you get? What what does one allow you to do? I always like asking interdisciplinary artists this question. It's like what what it, what do you see one being able to give you or one providing that the other might not or or what's the relationship between the two for you or and in right. your book you have stills. So right. I thought they were, you know, and then you realize that they're actual I was able to see the films and then Right. Okay, but the stills are so gorgeous. I mean, the film is gorgeous, but then the stills are like, you just don't know. So anyway. Right. right. Yeah, no, totally. Um, I mean, yeah, like when we, when we spoke, you know, I was talking about flipping the mode between the two because the first camera that I got has both like a video mode and a picture mode. So that's why I kind of said, oh, I was doing them simultaneously. Like I, yeah. I met them at the same time, but maybe I took them seriously or explored them in different ways at different mm -hmm. points. So I did move up to, to NYU to go to film school primarily. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's why I would say that was what I kind of started with first. But okay. I mean, it's a, good, it's a good question because I think um, like you say, when, when you speak to like other multidisciplinary artists, um, for me, the thing with photography and film is that, uh, and he, I'll even have like a conversation with um, Khalil Joseph, who like we talk and he's like, you know, I'm a moving image guy. And I kind of, I love how he says that because it's really like, I, I feel like I have an equal response to images still and moving. Mm -hmm. And so for me, they just require different things in the making of them. Like mm -hmm. I really do feel that like moving images, they 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 just have a different language and a different requirement when you're making them. It's kind of a different light, a different look. It's also a different, um, I don't know, without getting into the technical too much, it's kind of moving image almost requires like this, uh, it's not just the motion, right? It's also the drama, the narrative, the art, the what are the images in sequence presenting to you. Mm -hmm. um, and then these still images, you kind of get to create these little narrative worlds within the frame. So I, mm. I don't know if that like explains it well, but I kind of look at them as complementary um, yeah. sides of the same coin. And I kind of try to understand myself what each one requires to tell the story I'm trying to tell, if that makes sense. Yeah, I was thinking like, so as a writer, I have, there's like the book, there's the essay, um, and they have different, registers and different rhythms because sometimes they just have literally different deadlines but one you know but one is that like was the other part was just like oh the cam the, the photographic camera is a lot easier to make stuff more immediately yeah. it's kind of yeah. like it's the essay to the book or something i don't yeah it, it's not that it's should be looked at as any lesser yeah than movies are moving image but it's just that it creates a different relationship to the instrument yeah and i think for me sometimes a different kind of um I mean, a, a more immediate also release, right? Like you can get th this thing out in the world, you can get the feedback and then you can move on where another one, like a book is like an endurance test, right? Like you're just like, That's you like know, a, sorry, I'm obviously in the middle of a, <laughs> like, like, a such a process, yeah. yeah. <laughs> such a process right now. Um, so that makes, so, but also I was just thinking like, it's also, you know, these, we are all of these things that, you know, to we can't separate our, the disciplines or the mediums, um, maybe oftentimes black artists are asked to be put into a particular box, but that that's, we don't grow up seeing images that way or experiencing um, the tradition that way. So it's, it's odd to, to have to choose one or the other. Um, 
I guess my other question about like where we are now. And so you are, this book comes out um, and now Aperture, uh, the special, the special issue on Utopia comes out at a particularly daunting time, but your book came out really when, you know, the protests um, were in kind of full uh, momentum. And it really was another way of experiencing a kind of relief and release by looking at your images. And I was just curious, oftentimes uh, lots of people, and I think Deb talks about this at the end of the book. So I just want to quote this, that your work, we should read your work or see or experience your work in a tradition of, um, you know, social justice. And so she, if I can find it, I may not be able to find it. I had it all, okay, yep. So uh, she says, the freedom of the rigid confines of prescribed masculinity manifests itself elsewhere in Mitchell's body of work as he depicts black boys in ways that they are rarely shown, enjoying the innocence of childhood or physical mutual affection. Mm. Mitchell's reimaginings through his fashion and portrait photography is a unifying visual text of hope, love, and justice. And so I guess I would like to give you an opportunity to help us um, appreciate the justice aspects of your work, but also what was it like for this project to come out and your show to still be up during this crazy intense period of racial reckoning and a pandemic, right? You're, I mean, I was jealous that you were in the, the, the London backyard, but also just looking at your work when we're like in quarantine, right. Um, right. it was pretty amazing between the protests and the quarantine and then being able to experience your uh, these d black people in in nature, black people, um, in in really beautiful intimacy with each other was just really helpful. So I don't know if you want to think through uh, that, what you were, you know what that means for you actually. <laughs> I mean, it's it's hard to really. It's sometimes I, I I sometimes say something where after I've kind of made something right. It's kind of no longer between me and the person viewing it. It's kind of between the image and the person viewing it. At that point, yeah. I'm out the conversation, right? So yeah. it's like this book was being made, you know, for two years before um, this year, and um, I'm so happy to have seen the response that you just gave, right? Mm. To have seen people come into contact with these images, um, despite uh, the heavy year we've had, right? Despite the suffering. Um, death being around us um yeah but you know I'm extremely elated to like see the responses and uh especially during this moment I mean um one thing that I believe uh Antoine Sargent said that I really liked and again this is why I also feel like I don't know I'm the most if I'm the most fit person to like frame this up for people at this moment you know I don't I don't think I am but I think other people have really well and one thing that he said was um you know uh, the black artists that are working right now or like young black artists like myself there are others you know my contemporaries their work is both uh extremely pertinent to this moment but not necessarily of this moment right and mm -hmm. so it's mm -hmm. it's speaking to a continuum of artists who have been pushing right for this uh mm -hmm. making this insistence uh on our humanity right and also kind of looking uh kind of from from the inside out right rather than from the outside in so we're making this to reflect our own experience and that is what we are this is you know this book is like all the parts and things that i'm made up of this is just mm -hmm. like my experience put into a book into book mm -hmm. form so i'm i can simply sit here and be gracious and happy that people have like found it at a moment where there has been otherwise tough stuff around you know yeah no and thanks for bringing up um antoine's like the vanguard or the the uh, uh, right. uh, you're like a uh, right off like you know out of time but uh, out of, above time or ahead of time and then time catches up so yeah now that makes complete sense I'm gonna uh, I have some questions here from the general uh, audience okay so here we go um let me just read it first okay so Tyler you've been shooting in the fashion industry for some years now while exploring and presenting your own image of black expression and leisure my question this is not me but the person's question to you is was the fashion industry as a whole always accepting of this, uh, what, of what can be described as a radical viewpoint, or were there significant barriers that you've had to overcome before your message and photography was perceived and accepted, um, or received and accepted maybe by the industry in which you work in? Mm, yes. Um, it's a good question. It is. 
And I think that it goes into what I was just saying, which is kind of the the first thing is to tr- the first thing I think any artist sets out to do is to make good work. And then I hope that I think that they set out to hopefully have that work seen and to touch mm-hmm. people, right? Every artist wants to have their work seen and viewed by uh, by by people and and what they want to make good work. Um, I would hope. But I think that um, in that goal, in that aim, um, I think the that would the like going back to what I was just saying, it's kind of also again, it's still about looking from the inside out rather than from the outside in. So for me, you think about the famous Toni Morrison quote, it's like these people, these people whose experiences I'm reflecting and capturing, that's my center, right? That's mm-hmm. my, that's the center of my experience. Blackness is the center of my experience. So um, I can, I, I, in speaking and in making work from my experience, that's what I'm going to hopefully reflect rather than considering what the fashion industry, you know, has to say about that. Um, the other part of that is I worked an internship at the agency that actually um, represents me now, our partner, and what was the most interesting and kind of like shocking learning experience about that internship was um, flipping through, my job was to archive and flip through the, the all the magazines, basically a monthly, weekly, quarterly, biannual, and tab and archive um, all the artists represented by the agency and the ads that they worked on and the editorials that they worked on. So I became in a certain way, like this encyclopedia of knowing who exactly shot every single image that we're basically taking in uh, culturally, right? At bus stations, billboards, uh, magazines. And so I started to realize these are the same 10 or five people making all this stuff. Mm. There is no expansion of this circle. For the past 20 years, it's been the same people making the same stuff Mm. uh, of the same subject, of the same looking subjects. Mm. which sends a clear message to anyone who sits outside that circle, right? So mm-hmm. then it was just like this insistence and this like, uh, like, um, mm-hmm. this this insistence to expand that, um, and and to keep pushing to expand that. And I'm only one part of that expansion. There are other parts. So um, mm-hmm. understanding how people before me have pushed to expand that as well in other ways, and how people will continue to push to expand that after I come along. So my part in the cog in the wheel in the fashion industry is very small when you think about it that way, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, but uh, this is a question that has it's, it's come up here um, a lot. Well, first of all, like, when did you have that internship? Because that's so, like, for yeah, two that um, you... Like, when I'm, when I'm, it was probably whew, middle of college, so, like, five, six years ago, five years ago. Okay, okay, yeah. wow, okay, cool. Um, okay, so questions about collaboration in your actual uh, shoots. So uh, how do you, so, so can you talk about casting, who you cast, how you collaborate with your subjects, both for the commissioned work and also your personal work, or personal meaning non-fashion um, shoot work, I guess, is what people think. So. Right. So coll- co- collaborating with subjects. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that, which I kind of touched on a little earlier, it's, it's been important to me to allow uh, my sitters or the people that I'm kind of collaborating with to expand on my ideas of what the portrait uh, kind of is going to be that day, right? And what the portrait of them is going to be. And so I think it's about a conversation. So do you present like, like, how does it, like, I'm just curious in a more, in a way that's different than uh, other people like do you interview them or do you sit down interview or anything? It's not like an in-depth conversation. It's just kind of, I mean, I think it's more about creating this feeling of openness, like allowing mm-hmm. them to feel that they can kind of be however they want to be. Do you yeah. like, do you, do you actually feel like yourself in that hair? No, you don't. Let's change it. You know, mm-hmm. do you actually feel comfortable in, you know, some people, they just clearly have no interest in wearing heels, you know, and then it's, you're not going to force them into wearing heels for that. Cause they're not going to look like, they're not mm-hmm. going to look happy in that picture, you know, or it's not even about happiness. It's about like, are they, you're going to immediately recognize that they don't feel comfortable. Right, and, and that that's something that I'm not interested in in making with my images necessarily. Mm-hmm. But um, it's about changing those little things, and it's about creating an environment in which they feel able to contribute to that conversation rather than being shut out of it. Um, and feeling allowing people to feel like they're contributing to what's being made on the day, rather mm-hmm. than uh, kind of we're looking at you, right? You're the subject of our desire our ideas our everything right this this concept that we have that we're going to kind of affix to you as the Mm -hmm. model 
um, like that for me never works because then it never creates like a, a feeling of collaboration. So. So you just took the friendship, like those initial photographs that you did of friends, you took that feeling, that practice mm -hmm. and that feeling. And now that just is how you kind of work in the world, basically. Right. Some people, everyone starts with friends or family, but that you kept that intimacy and just, so that's interesting. Cause yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, someone has, okay, so I'm a black Detroiter. We're the same age, Tyler, and I'm writing a book on black utopianism. So thanks for this conversation. I'm more accustomed to conversations about my home space as a black dystopia, full of industrial ruins and empty spaces rather than a black Mecca. How right. do you think about the connection between black utopian and black, uh, black utopian and dystopian spaces generally or in your work? Mm. Good question. It's a really good question. They, they, could, they could have done the aperture essay on you. <laughs> <laughs> I like that because um, industrial ruin and Detroit and dystopia. Um, mm. I mean, you could, um, you, uh, another part to utopia is this, um, is this idea that, um, well, I think it's a couple ideas, right? This issue, I think, posits that the, the image makers in here are making images of desire in which they're kind of creating their utopian worlds, right? Mm -hmm. um, but also, mm -hmm. one could say that Detroit, right, and all of its kind of industrial ruin is a utopian world. There is mm -hmm. that's a site for possibility now at this stage. Um, and you look at kind of the way New York is looking these days, where I see a lot of <laughs> for rent and for sale signs and a lot mm. of vacancies. And, you know, you hear about, oh, 40% of people have left out of the richest, nicest neighborhoods in the, in all the boroughs. And I talk, I've even in looking for my studio space now, I was talking to some landlords and some property owners and they're like, all the tech companies are gone. All the artists are here. They're back. You know, Dumbo's being reclaimed by artists. Like, that's that kind of the ruin allows for utopia to come back in. So it's like mm. a flow of like, so I don't know if, um, hmm. I don't know if that's an answer to your question, but when I look at Detroit, I see something very possible there. Um, and I haven't been, uh, I went for one day actually, and I did, I need to spend more time, but I think that's an amazing place to kind of be in, to be considering those things. Hmm. That's really beautiful. Um, a ruin leads to utopia. That, that's really thoughtful. Um, what advice would you give to young aspiring photographers in terms of building a portfolio and getting your work out there? Building a portfolio and getting your work out there. Um, I think the biggest is, it really is about, um, I mean, the biggest tool is sharing work online. You know, right mm -hmm. now, today, there's such an amazing call and response, which I was kind of talking about earlier. And, um, I think yeah, I think a great question I'd love to ask you, you know, Salamisha is like, how do you even write a book in today's day and age? Like, I just I feel like I'm constantly in like, uh, I'm con like I'm constantly opening Pandora's box with the internet. I'm getting lost in there, and it's kind of like how hmm. do you do something without distraction? So I'm more kind of interested in like the creation of work in today's age. I think the sharing of it and the portfolio aspect is very easy. Um, mm. you know, the sharing and the being able to get a response on what work is working. So I, anyway, to answer the question, I think share online and create a community and, and, and get feedback from as much respected people as possible. And, um, and uh, just get the feedback, you know, don't even necessarily you take everyone's kind of feedback with a grain of salt, you know, you're gonna have your own feelings on what you're doing. Um, but that's anyway. I didn't yeah, mean to and turn it on to you, but I was. No, kind of, no, no, how it's fine. It? How, do you how, write? Do you, how, how does one write a book? I'm trying to say. Well, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I was writing two. I'm, I'm finished one and wrote and, and finishing another. I don't know. I mean, I think there's like you know, athletes and artists get into zones of productivity, and then we're also inspired by the urgency of the moment that we're in. I mean, if anything else, we have to make art. There's nothing else, you know, to quote Toni Morrison again, but that what else is left, right? Like, you know, and what is the form of resistance that we can engage in that we know will help someone else live through this moment too. So I guess that's kind of, I mean, it sounds like so intense, but <laughs> like, I do think that's part of it. Um, and then I have these two lovely little people that I live with um, who are artists themselves in, in lots of ways. And so they really do help just when they're not, you know, interrupting a Zoom call, for example, uh, 
I really do feel like, you know, I have this book on Alice Walker that's coming out in January that I dedicate to my sister. And then I have this book on Nina Simone that I'm, I'm dedicating to them and to my to my late brother. And I feel like, I don't know, just the moment Black Lives Matter, um, this is the age in which we have to, to make art that affirm our existence. Um, so that's right. kind of, um, there's a, Vic Moyo has lots of questions. So I just wanna ask one of his questions that I think relates to this kind of conversation. Um, what non, uh, I guess, film or uh, photo, photo, which non filmmakers or uh, photographers also provide inspiration for your work? Which is mm. a question that I haven't asked you yet. So. Right. Well, the list is long. Um, yeah. I mean, there are plenty, uh, and even people who, just in the way they exist. Well, shoot, I just thought of like three filmmakers. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, Maybe it's not that long. I was about to be like, hey, Sims, and I'm like, oh, she's a filmmaker. Um, <laughs> um, but I do like how she kind of calls herself a conceptual entrepreneur. Like, I like that. Mm-hmm. Idea. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I really like, um, I'm really inspired right now by the portraiture of Alice, uh, Alice Neal. Yeah. Um, you know, on a painting level, Carrie James Marshall, as I mentioned yeah. before. Mm-hmm. Um, uh shoot i'm trying to think of just other people in general i know i'm, I'm terrible with these questions. i have everybody on tiktok right now uh, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> in general like i'm serious like that that um app is like a fascination of this year and honestly the way that uh the conversation around memes which doesn't make its way into my work but i'm just inspired by is like i mean not to like distract from the conversation we're having but it's really phenomenal I think the way conversations are like spreading and changing through meme imagery Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um and proliferating and kind of Mm -hmm. spreading and then moving on to the next thing and it's kind of this like amazing thought bubble that we're all having um anyway I'm inspired by a lot of different things but I I'm kind of at a loss for naming them yeah, I tend to be terrible. Like I, I, I name like Beyonce or like you know, like I name like the like people who do inspire me. But I don't know how to like, like I know people always want like some artists they haven't heard of. I'm like I, I don't like I, I don't you know. So it's yeah. a hard question. Um, but I think we can we look like we can wrap up soon. Um, but I want to know where what do you I mean what you feel comfortable sharing where where you you have a new studio you have a new space. Yeah. Um, so what? Where are, you, where are you going with your your vision and your your justice images here, your freedom mm-hmm. images? <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. I mean, practical things. Yeah, figuring out you know new studio and moving into the space. Um, it's you know it's one thing I am excited about is um, you know, this uh, the we're doing you know I've been doing these movie nights for the past. Oh. Yes, yeah, I knew that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These yeah. movie nights, like I did two of them, and um, we're working on a third one that is going to be huh? next Friday. So I'm oh. about that. We haven't announced it, but actually, yeah. this is the first time I'm talking. First about time. It. Okay. Yeah, okay. Exactly. Okay. okay. <laughs> that that will be fun. We're gonna we're doing a movie night. It's gonna be in partnership with, or it's gonna be kind of in connection with the closing of my um, ICP show. You know, we had mm-hmm. all these programs lined up that we unfortunately couldn't do in person. Yeah. Um, and so now for me, my way to channel all these like programming ideas I was having for my show at ICP was these movie nights. So now this one's going to be in official connection with ICP. So okay. Zolda and I will be speaking, Deb and I will be speaking. There will be oh, some wow. films by Martine Sims, some yeah. films by um, Garrett Bradley, um, more surprises and more fun things. But like I just, I go on there and I just play visual material that I like. And it's a communal way to like, just kind of heal and be together and like chat there's a chat box and you know it's good good internet fun so when does your show um close officially so it officially closes december 31st um okay so we can everyone can still go um and then okay and i how do we get on this mail i'm not on this mailing list for your uh (laughs) yeah yeah, yeah if you go on to the best way we'll be going on to icp's website um, okay. icp.org um, I believe it is and if you 
and if you just stay tuned to my Instagram, I'll be posting all yep. the craziness and all the madness on there um, soon okay. enough. So the movie night will be fun. And then let's see what yep. next year brings. But I'm just um, excited to be here with you. And, you know. I know you're a gift of 20. There are some gifts, of, so many gifts of 2020, but you, you definitely are one of them. So I'm very grateful for our time together. And I look forward to future collaborations and more of your work in the world. So uh, thank you, uh, Aperture, for creating the space both in print um, and then here uh, in the in, in internet, uh, in the Zoom world for Tyler and I to reconnect. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Salamisha and Tyler, for that fantastic and generous conversation. Um, it's really just a privilege to listen to you two speak. You should really have, you guys need to have your own <laughs> podcast. It's so great. It's seriously some of the best energy I've seen on Zoom. Um, I just wanted to mention one quick thing to the question about Detroit. Um, there is an article in the issue called The Black Fantastic by a writer named Echo Ishan, and he talks about um, the fable of a black Atlantis created by Drexia, the 1990s Detroit techno duo. So he does get at Detroit as a context um, for thinking about utopia and dystopia. And I also just wanted to, since Tyler didn't, you shoot, uh, you flashed your book, but everyone needs Tyler's book. It's a must have for any photo book library. Um, so thank you both again. And just to um, the viewers listening, thank you for joining us tonight and for those great questions. We are doing a series of programs connected to the Utopia issue. Um, so we'll be back in January with the next installment. So you can check um, aperture.org to find out more information or sign up for our newsletter. So thank you both again. It was fantastic. Um, thank you. Beautiful. Thank you both.